Thank you very much for the introduction and great pleasure to give a talk here. So the talk is about how do you do we design stable coins and these are the co-authors uh, on the paper. So here's the outline of the talk. So let me go to the background first. So w w why we need a, a cryptocurrency? Well, the whole idea is you want to design a electronic cash. You have to solve two problems. For example, how do you avoid the duplication problem? In other words, if somebody have a, a electronic cash, that, that person in principle can copy this many, many times, just like copy a file or copy a video file. So how to prevent that? And of course, most important one is how do you prevent double spending problem? There was a big theorem in computer science showing that in general, it's impossible to reach consensus for the distributed computer system Bitcoin solved this problem uh, by introducing the idea of blockchain, which is a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer, uh, distributed network. And uh, the, the way you solve this double spending problem is by introduce mining and also uh, introduce uh, uh, cryptocurrency associated with that so that you have uh, economic incentive to do the right thing. So that's the basic idea about uh, blockchain. I'm sure everybody here knows this. Uh, another breakthrough coming around the late 2013 when Vitalik Buterin invented this Ethereum network on which you can write smart contract. That's a big thing because now you can have, uh, uh, you can do the programming, use, for example, Solidity language uh, to do blockchain programming. This will help potentially public lottery. Uh, legal work, as we heard yesterday. Uh, uh, one thing I should mention is every operation, you write program code in blockchain, uh, in Ethereum network, you have plus, minus, minimum, max, etc. Every such operation, you need uh, money in terms of the Ethereum to pay for that. In other words, this become endogenous. You cannot separate the uh, blockchain, uh, Ethereum blockchain network from the uh, the cryptocurrency anymore because if you have this, you have to pay for that. Okay, so that's one of the key uh, things uh, did in 2013. Now, there are thousands of the cryptocurrencies trading exchanges. One major drawback is that extremely volatile. Give an idea about how volatile it is. So let's look at ETH, Ethereum. Ethereum. So from October last uh, last year to about September 2018. So they go up and down. Now it's even down further, okay, around $116. So this is very volatile. The annualized volatility is about 110% compared to 13% of S&P 500. Now, what is a stable coin? Or well, a stable coin is the crypto coin that keeps stable market values against a major index or market uh, asset, for example, against US dollar. Well, stable coin is needed for, for three reasons. They can be uh, used within blockchain system to settle payment. They can be used to form as a money market account. In other words, suppose you want to do any investment. The traditional investment theory will tell us you can do uh, mean variance analysis or utilization, but essentially you need, you need a money market account to do asset allocation. But what is money market account in crypto market? To do that, you need to have a stable coin, serve as money market account. The third thing is, as I mentioned, if you want to do any small programming, you have to pay for them using the Ethereum, right? But because Ethereum is highly volatile, so the programming cost to write code is also very volatile. If I have a stable coin, that will solve the problem. Because, for example, you say, I have $50,000 budget for pro pay for the programming cost. I just put $50,000 in terms of stable coin. Whenever needed, I just convert to this. So that will help to reduce the uh, budget risk. So these are at least three reasons. Now, how do you create a stable coin? That's very interesting because this was called by many, many people as the holy grail of cryptocurrency. Okay, so I just cite some of the news media. So that's big open question in some sense. Now, there are at least four existing ways to do, uh, to design stable coin. So I'm going to t t tell you what are these four existing ways and I'm going to propose the fifth way, okay, to do this. Hopefully the fifth way will be, in some sense, better than the existing four ways. 
So what are the existing four ways? Number one, you can, you can essentially pack everything by real asset, either US dollar or gold or oil. For example, the, the most famous one is Tether, which 100%, suppose 100% backed by US dollar, okay? So that's uh, about $62 million, the total liability of this. But you see, even if they claim they packed 100%, but you see the difference, right? The total asset is less than the total liability. Right? And that's why they got uh, various investigations by the US government, right? So that's what they, you can also have the coins packed to, for example, gold. These are the companies try to do this. Of course, you can also have coins backed by oil as uh, Venezuela government did. Okay, so that's one way you pack this to some real asset. Okay. The second way you can do this is way used by the base coin, which just went bankrupt or something, okay? Because the idea there is you just set up a Federal Reserve. In other words, you act as the Federal Reserve for the coins issued. Whenever you have the coin price too high, you're going to issue new coins. When the, whenever the coin price too low, you just remove coins from the su uh, supply. Of course, that depends on how smart you are. Right? You, you're doing the same thing as Federal Reserve, so that's why it's not so easy. So this company is actually run by people from Princeton and not in good shape now. Okay. Now, the third way to do, the, uh, to do design of stable coins is this way about collateralized. So the essential idea is this. You deposit $150 worth of Ether, then you issue $100 ESO a stable coin. So you put $150 there, then you issue $100. So this $150 is in terms of this volu very volatile ESO or Bitcoin, right? Then you issue $100. Then of course, the, the collateral, the, the things you deposit fluctuate dramatically. So when, whenever the collateral reach, for example, $110, then the whole thing get liquidated, okay? That's a way the problem that you not you don't have enough to cover one hundred dollars. That's for example DAO. They have these DAI coins. That's basically the idea. Now this the, essentially this is the over collateralization idea, right? So you have to over collateralization. Of course, a drawback. There's several drawbacks. Okay, one thing is okay. You claim you deposit hundred fifty dollars. Who's going to verify that, right? Secondly, even if you did deposit hundred fifty dollars. This is too much money, right? So in order, in order to issue $100, you had to put $150 down. The cost of capital is quite high, right? So that's the third way. The fourth way is what happens, for example, some government, US government, Canadian government, just issue a uh, stable coin. They're backed by government, so the value will be the same as US dollar. So there's what discussions, for example, Fed coin is, uh, uh, is a working group within US and the C uh, Canadian, they have a similar version of call. So this is used to settle internal uh, balance within the uh, federal uh, banking system, not for the market, but within the itself. If interesting, there is last paper by, by Rod Garrett from, uh, 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 from California, he's a professor. Uh, 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 UC, UC California to uh, economics, so he has lots of people about this. So that's another way, so government issues this. Right now, of course, there's no major government issues. If had government issues this, that's uh, another way to do the stable coin. Now, there's some good things if government issue a stable coin, for example, presumably to produce a stable coin electronically is to, uh, cheaper in some sense then produce a cash because cash is going to be wore out, right? So you have to print the cash with some te technology and replace cash, etc. Then these coins can be can be tracked and taxed automatically, presumably by blockchain. They can also facilitate facil uh, statistical work. For example, you want to compute GDP data or certain consumer data, you just look at ch uh, the coins issued in blockchain. They cannot be forged, at least in theory. And they can simplify some legal transfers inside outside countries. So the Batch and Garrett, they have lots of discussions along these lines, talk about the main benefit of this kind of things. So now, what's our idea? We're going to introduce the fifth way to design uh, stable coin. So our idea is use option pricing theory. Okay. So in other words, 
you're going to split the original very volatile uh, crypto asset, such as Bitcoin or ETH, into two things. So original one you split, you're going to split A and B. A and B, such as A is much more stable and B is highly volatile. Then you can split A even more. So you have A and B, A is quite stable, B is very volatile, then you split A again to A prime, B prime, then A prime will be very, very stable. Essentially, I look at cash, okay. So that's simple idea, that's basic idea, you just tranche them. Just like, for example, the many, way, many things in financial market tranche, right? right? The uh, structure product in Wall Street, many of these are tranche. So this same idea, you just tranche them. So how to tranche this? this very interesting. So our design is inspired by this called dual purpose fund, popular in US in, and in China. It no longer exists. The dual purpose fund no longer is, exists in US and uh, still exists in China. Our design is inspired this, it's different from this, but the main uh, feature, very similar, okay. So what happens? Well, so essentially you're going to split into two things, A and B. B is like more like cash or money market or bond. Oh, sorry, A is more like cash or money market. B is like takes a leverage to buy more of the analysis. In other words, essentially the idea is, okay, you put, uh, put the, for example, ETH here, then essentially B, borrow money from A to buy more ETH. The A is like lend money to B, so A is like bond, risky bond, okay. Now of course, once A lend money to B to buy the ETH, you have lots of credit risk, right? The B is very volatile, you're going to have credit. So you have to set up the barriers to reduce the credit risk. So what happened is, you're going to have some downward reset. Once the value of this reaches a certain level, A and B will, will readjust. The detail will come in a few seconds. So that's way to reduce risk. If the analysis go up a lot, then you also need to reset because B need to take profit out of the table. Okay? So you're going to have downside reset and upside reset to do these things. Then after you split the original asset into A and B, you further, you, to reduce volatility, you can split the vanilla A coins, original A coins, into A prime and B prime, similar fashion. Then you essentially look at A, which is a little bit volatile, A prime is very stable, then you essentially have a, a stable coin, but written on the crypto domain rather than real domain. Okay, just give you some uh, uh, basic idea about how stable the coin is. So this is the, the volatility of ETH from this period, S&P period, gold, US dollar. If you look at our class A coins according to different models, if you look at geometry bond and motion model, you get about 2.7% volatility. You, if you use the jump diffusion models, you're going to uh, volatility range about this. So A behave more like a junk bond. The volatility is more like a junk bond. But if you look at A prime coin, no matter what, which model you're going to look at, whether you look at geometry by the motion model or jump diffusion model, the volatility is about 1.1%. This volatility is even lower than the US dollar volatility. Yeah. Just want to clarify, yeah. uh, supposedly the A prime coin should have a little bit higher volatility in this jump diffusion model. Yeah, yeah. So the little bit high, yes. Little bit high is uh, not up to the second decimal yeah. point. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, a little bit, yeah, 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 so that's true. So in other words, essentially, because A prime has such low volatility, you can regard as stable coin, okay? So that's, that's the idea. So in other words, you use uh, the base idea from the like, structural product, do the tranches, then you, if you have enough tranches, you're gonna get a stable coin out of that. So that's the key idea, okay? Now, uh, now what, what's implication? Okay, so there are a few things, okay? The, of course, you have policy implication. You have you now design a stable coin. Now the stable coin we design is to a large extent very stable. It will only incur loss. You have huge jump, which I'm going to talk, talk about later. So in other words, if you really have no jump at all, what you can do is you have like a private company to do this uh, stable coin things. Then government will only back up at very extreme events. Okay, which have, so then with this you have very. Uh, uh, stable, uh, really, truly stable coin. One thing I should clarify is, 
our design stable coin require very little capital because essentially what you do is you set up a company, says that you give me two shares ETH, I will give you, for example, 500 shares A and 500 shares B, right? So you give me two share ETH, I will give you 500 A, 500 B. And anytime anybody bring me 500 share A and 500 share B, I will give you two share ETH. So there's essentially, in theory, there's no capital cost for this company. This company simply plays the merger and split the things, right? That's, so unlike the over collaboration things, you put $150, you get $100, right? So this company just plays the intermediate role, right? So the very little capital uh, cost. In terms of mathematics, because we're in the Center for Mathematical Sciences, what, are there any mathematical difficulty? There's some mathematical difficulty because you, you solve these equations, you find out you don't have the standard Blaschow's equations. You have uh, Blaschow's kind of PD, but periodic PD with time dependent upper barrier and time dependent lower barrier. So you have to really uh, justify what do you mean by stochastic representation of PDEs, and you have to design some new numerical procedures to solve this. So these are technical things actually uh, we're not going to talk about today, but that's in the appendix paper if you really want to know why we're doing uh, solving this particular PDEs, et cetera. Okay. So uh, these are literature reviews. The key thing to point out is, okay, as I said, they have dual purpose found in US, dual purpose found in China, and our proposed dual, uh, uh, vanilla A and B coins. Here are some differences. For example, the dual purpose found in US is dividend payment. Here our payment to A is fixed income. And here they have, in US they have single payment, here payment affects exchange ratio, but not that. As a, so there are some difference here. Now in terms of papers, uh, uh, Jonathan Ingelson, Bob Giro, and uh, Maureen O'Hara, they have papers about uh, dual purpose US purpose fund uh, 30 years ago. Okay, now, then there are papers about uh, dual purpose fund in China, but our things is different from there. Essentially, we have a periodical PD with a time dependent upper barrier, but they don't have these features. So there's some uh, difference in terms of mathematical contribution. Now, uh, there is also inter intensive literature about uh, cryptocurrency, et cetera. Uh, so there are lots of papers about uh, cryptocurrencies, a, deb a debate about uh, plus or minus cryptocurrencies. I just want to mention one thing that is, okay, in a debate, one uh, thing was missing is like this. Oh, people might say, okay, blockchain is good, cryptocurrency is bad, okay, so. But they're missing one important component that is, in order to use Ethereum network to do programming, you need to have Ethereum money. So these two things go together in certain sense. Okay, you cannot say one will survive, one will disappear. That's not true. They go together, okay, to a certain extent. So either they all go disappear or they all survive, okay. So now I, I'm going to tell you about the, the design detail. So initially, here what happens. Suppose the ETH share is $500. So the design goes like this. If you give me two shares of ETH, I will give you 500 shares of A and 500 shares B. Okay? So give me this, I just split this one. So you have 500 shares A, each worth $1. 500 shares B, each worth $1. Okay? And of, the idea is B will borrow one from A. Okay? So that's initial split. Give me 500, two ETH, I will give you 500 A and 500 B. Okay? Then A going to get interest repayment from B. Right? So what happens, for example, you say, oh, A is going to get two cents interest payment every three months. Okay, fine. So let's say after 100 days, suppose ETH price dropped to 500, 450. Now, you, after 100 days, A is going to get two cents interest payment right, from B. So, so then before the payment, the value of A will be $1.02, the value of B, because B is what I have left, right? Now the ETH only worth 550, so the B will worth 78 cents. Now you're going to do a split, right? So in other words, you're going to give A uh, two cents back to A, A go to this. Then this, this you're going to say, okay, now you do the new exchange ratio calculation. Now the two shares of ETH now going to convert to 505 and 62. Why you have 505 and 62 cent shares? That's because total value now is two times 450 
divide by whatever things left, 500, 500. So that will give you the new ratio of change right, after the, uh, the interest repayment. So this ratio will only change if you have the interest repayment from A. Otherwise, it will not change. Now, suppose ETH price go, doing so good, going from 500 to 760.95, then B reach $2. We, we lost money. Now you do the split. In other words, you're going to, to reach the upper barrier. You're going to do the reset. So B will take one dollar off the table, and A will take one, one cent off the table. Why one cent? Because after 50 days, A supposed to get one cent interest payment. So A will take one cent off the table. B take one dollar off the table. Afterwards, there's still one dollar left for A. One dollar left of B. Fin finish. Okay. So that's upward reset. Now what happens if market bad? You have downwards. So suppose the ETH dropped to 479. So then B dropped to 25 cents. Now when it reach 75 cent, 25 cents, you're going to have a downward receipt, reset to reduce credit risk because B now on the verge of bankruptcy has chance, uh, significant chance to go bankrupt. So it does reset. So in this case, A will take 76 cents out of the table. 75 cents here and 1 cent interest repayment. So A takes 70 cents off the table. Now you have 0 0.25, 0 0.25. Then you do a 4 to 1 merge. You still have 1 to 1. So this way you, you, you balance 1 to 1. So that's basically the idea. Of course, from this, you can simply say no arbitrage implies you put A and B together is essentially 2 times original one subject to this uh, split ratio. Yeah. One key issue, obviously, is that when you reset, yeah. Very good. So in, in our paper, we assume that when, whenever you have this reset, you pay U.S. dollar, but you can do coins. Okay. If you, you, you do U.S. dollar, this will truly make it stable. Yes. If yeah. it's a U.S. dollar, right. it's clearly right. people right. thinking, you right. know, right. Right. This, right. Is, this is a pegging problem. Right, 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 right. 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 It could be a thing, but right. a lot of times if you don't do the dollar payment, then this unstable part of Right. So in other words, you have a smaller unstable part compared to before. But you pack this. So in your paper, we only discuss you do everything in U.S. dollars. So in other words, if I get payment, you, you so dividend payment are always in U.S. dollar in this case. But, but in practice, in your in your you know, proposed project, right? Are you thinking about U.S. dollar? Yeah, yeah. U.S. dollar. Right, right, right. right. So in other words, every hundred day you get the dividend payment. The dividend payment is in terms of U.S. dollar credit to A. Okay, so uh, A will behave like a corporate bond because A still have a risk due to B because it's like a risky corporate bond. Nevertheless, so uh, the main risk of A, okay, so we are down as we said. Now, to reduce the volatility of A again, you can split A into A prime, B prime. So, so same picture. So essentially, A prime will borrow, uh, B prime will borrow money from A prime to buy A. So you do the same thing. A prime split into Oh, a, uh, yeah, so, so this is a, a, B, a prime, B prime, you split this. So you do similar things, same, same message. Okay, so you split this again into A prime, B prime. Uh, what happened? You have uh, upside reset, downside reset, et cetera. So this way, you're going to get a very stable A prime after these two level of uh, tranches. That's the idea, okay. Now, now what happened? You have really a black swan event, okay. So a simple calculation, let's do a simple calculation. So when the A, a prime will lose money, A prime will lose money only if, only if the B jumps so much. In other words, B suddenly jump not to the 25 cents, but jump way below that, okay. Then you will have lose money. So take some tip plan, for example, suppose the interest rate A gonna get is 7.3% per year, and the interest rate A prime get is 3% per year, you're gonna do the payment every 100 days, the lower set barrier is 25 cents, upper set barrier is $2. You do simple calculation, you say that unless the underlying asset, which is ETH or Bitcoin, drops 60%, A prime will not take loss. So in other words, if you have a sudden drop of 60%, even A prime will take loss. Okay. The, so, then, so then you look at history. Are there any case where ETS lost 60% value in a single day. Yes, there's one day, okay. On second trading day, August, 5th, uh, August 8th, lost 60%. Of course, you can mitigate the risk a little bit. 
after that, the largest loss a single day is about 26% in terms of ETH. You can argue whether this number is useful now because it's on the second day of trading. But nonetheless, you can mitigate reset that I'm going to check reset every one hour, then you don't have such a problem, right? Every one hour, I'm going to check reset, yeah. Right, so the, the drop here is minus 60%. So the unit here, for example, could be one day or one hour, right? So does that depend on how often you like Yeah, yeah, so, in other words, so you, you set up this uh, downside reset barrier, right? You can specify in the contract how frequently you're going to monitor the contract. Right? You can say that every day, like 4 p.m., I'm going to check this. If it's below 25 cents, I'm going to reset. So that's what. Oh, you can even, even say every hour I'm going to monitor this, which is not impossible, right? So, uh, so that will significantly reduce this uh, black swan event for A prime. What's the number for not A prime, but just A? Oh, A, you'll see a picture. OK, you, A will be quite different, OK? A will have multiple reset through the history, OK? I will show you a picture, OK? A prime is very stable. In other words, the key thing, remember, is A is a corporate bond, risky corporate bond. A prime is stable coin. Okay, so that's it. okay. So you, you do a, you, 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 if you do a reversing, so that's thing, okay. So we have A, a B, A prime, B prime. One thing you can argue is, oh, the lost people are going to buy A and buy A prime because they're more stable. Who's going to buy B, right? Now you can do the contract that are very similar. Because B is highly leveraged. B is like 200% leveraged, right? Who's going to buy B? Of course, you can argue there's some small proportion of speculators want this, right? But if you really think that the demand for B is so low, such that the price of B is significantly lower, right? Because demand, you can do a simple contract that, that is, instead of B paying interest rate to A, A pay interest to B, okay? There's nothing prevent this, right? A just pay, because A get a very stable thing, so A pay, let's say, 10% interest to B, so B is already, Although B is leveraged, but B gets certain payment from A. So you can do that. The contract is fine. All the mathematics works so, no, no problems. You know, it's like reverse payment. A just gave money. So if you say A gave money to B 10%, okay, then the downside risk will be significantly lower, okay? Well, not, not sure you're packing to the dollar, right? A prime still packing to the dollar. Right, so, oh, no. so this interest rate is set by right, mutual agreement between A and B, yeah, yeah, right. the, by contract design. So all the, all the rate, which say is, for example, I say uh, B pays A 2%, that means B pays A 2% rate, right? The coupon rate. I, I should say coupon rate. Coupon rate. That's to clarify. Okay, so A gets either positive coupon rate or negative coupon rate. Right? Right, right. Just like. A, right, right, right. Right, right, right. So, that, that, like for example, you hold a US Treasury bond, US Treasury bond has coupon rate, which quite like 3%, 4%, whatever. That can be quite different from risk free rate, right? So, the same thing. You can get a positive coupon rate or negative coupon rate. Right. So you get negative coupon rate, you get a lower uh, a black swan event risk. Okay. So now we have to write thing about something about economics. I mean, we will submit paper, the referee also writes, what's your economic insight? So we have to write something economic insight. So put it in the equilibrium. So we take, so next two slides about economics. If you're not interested, you can skip a little bit, but I just mentioned a few. So, so talk about demand and supply. Okay, so suppose you have original ETH, okay. Now, who, what's the demand supply going to come? Our supply, you can model this, use the Barrow's classical model. It's median change supply, et cetera. Then there's speculative uh, demand. You, you model by this, you match the demand supply. So you get uh, some equation like this. Then you show that there is a price that can clear this demand supply equation. That's without stable coin. Now you add stable coin. You say add A and B with ratio one to one. What happened to the market? Okay. So instead of going this mass, I show you the picture. So you, you can show that equilibrium exists, et cetera, with this demand supply. So this is an interesting picture. So suppose you 
add this stable coin, A and B kind of thing, to the market, what happened to the ETH price? That's the first question, right? Will ETH price be higher or lower? Second question is, will it help ETH to be more stable or less stable, right? So these two pictures try to answer these two questions. So if you add the uh, A and B, then it appears the ETH price will go down, depending on what percentage market will accept these coins. In other words, gamma two is percentage market will use the new stable coins. Okay, so of course if it's 100%, that means all the ETH are replaced by the stable coins, which is zero means nobody uses this. So, so, so as you, in the model, as you use more and more these stable coins, then the price of ETH will going down. Here is the thing, interesting. So this talk about sensitivity of ETH with respect to speculation. Now, the higher A is, the more speculation in terms of this. So if it is partial derivative, partial P, partial A is bigger, that means ETH is sensitive to speculator. So as you see, as market use more and more stable coins, the speculation sensitivity get less. So in some sense, this helps to stay the market in that sense. Even the ETH price in, in, in Chrome will be less sensitive to the speculative uh, demand. So this talk about, okay, what percent of people in the Ecolum will be used different kind of uh, coins for different purpose, speculative A, speculative B, ETH, et cetera. So this range from zero uh, market adoption to one market adoption. So this some picture showing the, what fraction people use what. Okay, so that's few slides about uh, 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 economics. Okay, now if one comparison, essentially c compared to DAI, we don't have the um, uh, excess uh, collateral thing, so because the firm will only act intermediate. Whenever you give me two shares ETH, I give you 500 share, 500 share B. And if you give 500 A and B, I give this. So there's a very minimal capital tied up. So, and also the pack to US dollar is is through the derivative things rather than the hard core part, part. okay. So that's the uh, one. Now, in terms of valuation, how do you compute these things? Well, you do some math, okay, so you're going to have downward side boundary, upside boundary. This is stochastic payment. Then you write down the PDEs. So just one short set of PDEs, write down PDEs and the geometric bound motion model. So this is your black shows PD we saw from option pricing literature, so that's common. What's unusual about this PD are the boundary and terminal conditions. So the boundary condition are non-local and terminal condition are non-local. So they're periodical PDEs, so you see. The value here depends on the value itself. Value here depends on the value itself. So that makes the PD uh, not the standard PD. So you have to show, okay, this PD really has a solution, unique solution, and the unique solution indeed is represented by this uh, expectation. So you do some work, okay, to show this, okay. So that's make uh, the problem uh, not mathematical trivial, okay. Now you do the same thing for A prime, B prime. That's payoff for the A prime. Then you do similar PD. So this PD will depend on the solution of this PD because A prime depend on A. So you, then you do a numerical scheme. So with numerical scheme, you have to be a little bit careful because you need to find out a monotonic numerical scheme so that you can solve this in a stable way, which will lead to another stable solution for this. So this is some uh, numerical problem you need to solve. Okay. Uh, okay, so now I show you some numerical examples. For example, these are settings, uh, risk-free rate, sigma, uh, volatility we assume is 170% per year for the underlying asset, which is very high. Okay, now we show you, okay. Now to answer your question about reset of A, a is not stable coin. A gets several resets. You see here, if you look at historical data and do the calculation, the upside, upward reset takes place on these days, and there are three downside resets already. So in other words, on these three times, the value of B reached 25 cents, then A and B get downward reset. There is a regular payout uh, coupon payment date on July 28th in this uh, simulation, simulated study. So that's for the market value A. So A has some volatility, right? So it is like one cent, two cents, three cents. So it has some volatility. Some of this downside 
some uh, like uh, uh, July uh, July 28th. So that's uh, right. so this is a dividend uh, dividend payment. Okay. Now B B is very volatile because B is like two times leverage, right? So you see the scale of B is like one dollar to two dollar, right? So this highly volatile, right? Because B is leveraged product, right? B. B, this talk about the, the reset dates, upward reset, downward reset, same dates as before. Now, A prime, very stable, right? You see the range, this A, so A prime, this, this. This is A, so middle one's A. A is split into two, A prime, B prime. Okay, B prime is like a leveraged bond. A is bond, A prime is like money market. Okay, yeah. so that's give you this uh, simulation based on historical data. Okay, so that give you different days what happened to various event, upside, downside event. So, uh, so, so this this talk about how do you calculate volatility, volatility of A prime coins depend on what you count the dividend payment as part of volatility or not. If uh, uh, if you look at volatility, this is, uh, uh, w if you assume volatility O convert to A prime, volatility will lower, like 0.025. Okay, so the jump risk, you can do the same thing with jump diffusion model. Okay, so for example, the jump size, you can put these double exponential jumps. You do the recalculation. The calculation I'm going to skip because it's much more complicated because you, instead of PDE, you're going to have a partial integral differential equations. So periodical partial integral differential equations with non-local terminal condition and non-local boundary conditions. So I skip the detail, but you can do the calculation. Okay. So this parameter you have here, and this talk about you using the uh, the jump diffusion model with a parameter here, what you're going to get. So the okay. So this table shows the value of A prime, B prime, non-value total return, etc., compared with the S and P, etc. So let me conclude, then we can have a debate or discussion, okay? So within the ecosystem blockchain, we need a stable coin to do settle transaction, pay miner to asset allocation. We, we design A, B, A prime, B prime. So A prime, you're going to have a stable coin. And this is inspired by due person fund in China and US. This can be served as basis for uh, issue stable coins. And if you want government, so how the government can jump in? Well, as I mentioned, suppose you have 60% drop, sudden drop, then even A prime will not be safe, right? So one way you can do is, okay, government will jump in and say that, okay, if you have sudden 60% drop within less than one hour or so, then government will guarantee, then that way you even don't have that risk, right? So I guess I stop here and I have 10 minutes for question and answer. Yes. Uh, the, the you will. Uh, so, no, let me. Impossible because every dollar of the stable coin in circulation means two dollars worth of fees. Yeah, 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 let, let, let's go. Let's go. So let let me explain this. One. So this picture shows that if increase the demand, if the large proportion of people are using stable coins rather than the original ETH, this is the price of the original ETH. So in Colum. So if there's no stable coin, suppose, for example, price 7.5, this doesn't matter. You can change to 100 you want. So then if I introduce stable coins, the price gets lower. Now, no, what happened is, what happened is this, you have complex, right? So let's look at demand. Demand for original ETH, you can split in two parts as in our model, right? So the first part is uh, the service demand, which includes, for example, you need ETH to run your program code. You need ETH to pay for lawyer fees, etc. So, so that's a real demand you can think about. Then you have speculative demand, right? So that's the part. Okay. Now, once you introduce this stablecoin, what happens? Well, some of this speculative demand will be replaced by B, right? Now, for every B, you're going to have A, right? Right. So, in other words, B will take some of the speculative demand. Then, correspondingly. What happened to A? Well, if you look at speculative demand for the ETH, it can also split in two parts. Either ETH 
you, because you do the uh, asset allocation, right? For the, for asset allocation, you also need the cash, right? Cash and the, uh, ETH, let's say. So some of this A will serve as a cash. That's also count as speculative A demand. You see, right? So in other words, we say speculative A. So this orange color here is the speculative A used as money market for asset allocation, not for the real demand. Okay, so that's it. Conceptual understanding is that some of the services provided by original yeah. coin now take by A to A to a split of the original. Yeah. So so let's so the so now. Do the, you have an arbitrage option in Bitcoin for the world? Shouldn't be. Shouldn't be. No no arbitrage. Be. So, so A plus B is yes. Yeah yeah so yeah. Right, 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 essentially, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you, so you, important to clarify, you see, here also one thing, I, there's this uh, tiny green area here, what is this? So this, uh, for example, this, assume, we assume that you have, for example, program demand. In other words, you have to pay ETH to run your code. That demand can only be, this real demand can only be supplied by ETH, cannot be supplied by A or A prime. So, so that, Stay there. Doesn't matter what happens. Right. Other part of demand, for example, legal fees, lawyer fees within uh, within the blockchain system can be supplied by A now. That's non-speculative A demand. Okay. Um, I'm just curious. Is there a trust question around the I'm calling them rebalancing events? You know, when you do your right. things, and just wonder if you could expand on that. And, and okay. Yeah, yeah. So all the things in real life is done on blockchain. In other words, the contract, for example, let's go back. So the contract will say automatically, okay, so for example here, whenever the B price reach 25 cents, automatically smart contract will say, okay, you're going to take money out, take money out, then do a reverse four to one merge automatically. Okay. And you have to price the, the derivatives as well? Uh, so when so this you talk about you, you talk about real term this talk about net asset value right, so then the market the traded price will be different from this right, right. So in other words, to do this calculation you don't need to have any model, but to get get uh, to get this picture, you need the Black Scholes equation, right. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Very much.